Welcome everybody, Joe Noriel, President of the Petaluma Museum. A very special series for us, you know, it's hard to escape it in the media, 2012, what's going to happen? There definitely seems to be something behind it, real or unreal, there's, there's something that's touching the human psyche on this issue, so we thought as an organization, you know, let's look into this a little bit, let's explore what's going on with this. And, uh, last night we had a gentleman speak about the psychology of natural disasters, and today we're focusing on the cosmic issues with 2012 and the alignments and all those fun things. So, with that, a very special guest uh, this evening, but before I introduce him, I have a special guest to introduce our special guest. And <laughs> That's Lynn Kaminsky. She's a professor of physics and astronomy at Sonoma State University. She's an expert in X-ray and gamma ray astronomy and a good friend of the museum. I'm, I'm a little bit responsible for bringing Dr. Morrison here because I recommended him as a speaker, even though I haven't actually heard this particular talk of his. His reputation precedes him, and I'm so glad that everybody could come out to downtown Petaluma on a holiday weekend to hear about the end of the world. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Probably not. And so he's, Dr. Morrison's going to tell us about um, all of that and, and why it's really probably not. Um, he is the senior scientist at NASA's Astrobiology Institute and the director of the Carl Sagan Center for the Study of Life in the Universe. And this is at NASA Ames Research Center down there in Mountain View, Moffett Field. Um, he has a Ph.D. in astronomy from Harvard. He's the auth an author on over 150 scientific papers, as well as over a dozen books. He's received pretty much every medal you could um, get awarded at this point, um, at any point in anyone's career. The Dryden Medal for Research from the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. The Sagan Medal of the American Astronomical Society for Public Communication. The Clumpy Roberts Award for the Astronomical Society of the Pacific for <coughs> contributions to science education. Two NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals, the Presidential Meritorious Rank, and his work of Director of Space at NASA Ames. But from the point of view of this talk, it's probably more relevant that he spent a lot of time trying to warn the public about the real dangers of possible asteroids coming and hitting the Earth. And as a result of that, there's an asteroid named after him. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Morrison. Thank you. By the way, I said a shorter version of that. You didn't have to. Do that. <laughs> uh, it's nice for me to have the opportunity to talk about this at some length because I've been recognizing that to communicate to a lot of people, the only way you can do it is with YouTube videos with about a maximum length of four minutes. So I've been practicing condensing what I said. It's a privilege tonight to be able to talk a little more. Rhythm. Um I have indeed spent a lot of my career uh, studying the threat, the hazard of impacts on Earth from comets and asteroids. Uh, it's one of those things that when, when we started thinking about it 20, 25 years ago, we had what was called the giggle factor. People just didn't think it was plausible, and of course there's a good reason. Uh, not only had you never known anyone who was killed by an asteroid, you'd never read about it, it's never happened in human history, or almost never. And so it, uh, it seems a little outlandish. And so I spent a lot of years trying to explain to people that this was a real hazard, and that even though impacts were extremely rare, uh, when they came, they could kill millions of people at one time, or hundreds of millions of people. So it was a, a hazard that had a different kind of packaging from the natural hazards many of you may have heard about yesterday. Uh, 
you, where you kill an awful lot of people but do it extremely rarely. And I got to be known as Dr. Doom uh, because I went around telling people that uh, although this may seem outlandish, that there was really a significant threat of asteroid impacts. Well, here I am trying to undo that reputation <laughs> because I have become interested and then appalled at the public fascination with the end of the world, particularly associated with 2012. To me, as a scientist, even talking about the end of the world is absurd. Uh, the world's been here for four and a half billion years. It's gone through some trauma from time to time, including asteroid impacts, but certainly nothing would threaten its existence. What kind of mindset is it to think that after four and a half billion years, in your lifetime, the world's going to end? It's going to end next year. I mean, that blows my mind. So I started looking into this primarily because I answer questions from the public on a NASA website called Ask an Astrobiologist. And every workday, five times a week, I post a new question and answer. And, you know, it's moderately popular. A lot of people will look at it. And I answered questions primarily about astrobiology, astronomy, planetary science until just a little over three years ago when I got my first question about will the world end in 2012. And I looked it up a little bit, I posted an answer, and came ten more questions about the world ending in 2012. At first I was receiving about one a week. Then it went to one a day, now it's about one every two hours. So clearly, uh, for better or worse, I have jumped into a, uh, an odd, interesting, and rather disturbing factor of people who are afraid of the end of the world in 2012. And I'll talk to you in a minute about that, how that comes about. Um, many of the people that write to me actually are quite angry at me for, for denying this. I, there, there seems to be, yeah, yeah, there are a lot of people who act as though they want the world to end, uh, which strikes me as a little strange. Uh, but then I can't tell whether the people that write to me are representative of any larger group. And so here's a large group. How many of you are afraid that the world is going to end in 2012? Um, how many of you, at least before this, this set of talks, had heard that the, there was a rumor that the world might end in 2012? <laughs> ah, that is by far more than I have ever seen in any audience. And this is what part of the, the thing that's strange to me, is there are some groups who are really into this, and many who are not at all. I'll give you two examples of not at all. I gave a lecture to a undergraduate course of about 40 people at uh, Stanford University and I asked them the same sort of question. Eyes open, their mouths open, I said, you've never heard of that, that's, that's crazy. Um, this last week I got a note from an amateur astronomer who said he had never heard of it until he heard of it from me. And so he asked in his amateur astronomy book, not one of them had ever heard of this supposed doomsday. So it's a strange phenomenon. It, it obsesses some people. Many, like you, at least have heard about it. And many others have not at all. And I'm not quite sure how that comes about. We can talk about that later. Let me uh, show you what I brought. It's not fast responding. <coughs> how many of you saw the movie 2012? Did you like it? No. <laughs> well, it's a real slam bang Hollywood disaster film, that's for sure. Um, it is interesting to me for two reasons. First, the publicity leading up to this film was extremely bothersome to me because the ads that appeared on television over and over did not suggest they had anything to do with the film. It's the world is going to end, there is a scientist from all over the world have gotten together, they predicted it's going to happen in 2012, you know, they show shots of them. people who look like scientists wearing ties and all that, you know, and, and gave you the impression it was real without ever even 
identifying this as being an ad for a movie. Then the movie came out, and I don't think anybody could take it seriously. It was just a wild, wild ride of a Hollywood movie, which is fine. Um, it actually made my job easier, because if people raised the question in 2012, I'd say, oh, come on, don't, don't kid me, I'm just a Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. um, what I learned later from a member of the cast, which interested me, is that when the movie was written, and even in the starting of filming it, no one involved with the movie knew about this 2012 thing either. And they simply picked the, the name up and tacked it onto the movie. It was never intended to be a movie about 2012. And if you actually look at it, you can see that the, most of the things that happened there, you know, the sun producing neutrons, destabilizing the core of the Earth and so forth, that's not part of the 2012 legend at all. And so they just took the name. And uh, well, so be it. It made a lot of money, which didn't particularly make me happy, but it did not, in my, from my perspective, uh, really add to the problem of people who, don't, who are being misinformed. Um, these are more part of the problem. Books. There are still people who read books. Stop being in a library, we should recognize that. Uh, when I first looked two years ago, there were more than 300 books listed on Amazon.com about 2012 Doomsday. I expect it's up to four or five hundred by now. At the same time, there were more than 10,000 websites about it. And, you know, I said, what's going on here? Uh, and I started looking at some of these books, and they really give you the, the genesis of this strange rumor and fear about 2012. Because I asked myself, why 2012? What is there about 2012 that could produce this sort of widespread fear? And so, I want to show you some of that. I also want to show you this. I mentioned my own NASA Ask an Astrobiologist website. But if you really want to look at stuff, this is the best website anywhere. Because it's not just one person like me. It's, it's about a dozen scientists who contribute to it. And they've organized it, you know, with the, with, with a nice table of contents, you can go in with any particular question and basically they pull up a page or so of information about it. 2012books.org. Uh, and so that's just in case any of you want to follow up on this. You're also, of course, welcome to look at my, my website. So these are what I identified as the main sources of this fear. And I'm going to go through each of them and talk about whether any of those are valid or whether they're or not. And uh, just to read the list, Nancy Leader is a psychic, and she's being warned by extraterrestrials. Zechariah Sitkin is a faker who claims that he could uh, translate Sumerian documents that he had found and uh, that they predicted doomsday. John Major, J Major Jenkins is another guy who's not. I'll show you what it comes to. He calls himself an independent investigator, independent researcher. And that's code for saying he does not have a degree and he doesn't have a job. <laughs> you know, that he's just self-appointed. Sadly, Michio Kaku is quite a well-known physicist uh, from this part of the world. And he's not helping. And then NASA, of course, gets blamed for things. And I don't think we deserve it, but you can judge for yourself. And finally, have you heard of Comet Element? How many people have heard of Comet Element? It is a wimpy little comet that was discovered last December and has acquired a whole collection of myths about it. And we'll come to that, back to that too. Uh, that, that somehow that has become... In the last few months, I've received as many questions about Comet Element as I do about all the other 2012 rumors put together. So let's start with Nancy Leader. She is a self-declared psychic, and she has an implant in her brain, she says, that allows her to receive messages directly from the inhabitants of the star Zeta Reticuli. Uh, and she calls them Zetans. They have names. And about uh, 
10 years ago, they started warning her that there was this planet X that was going to come and, if not destroy the Earth, at least do terrible damage to us in May of 1983. Not, excuse me, 2003. <coughs> um, well, I think we're past May 2003, right? Did you notice the world ending or anything like that happening? No. Uh, but she was predicting it up to one week before the date that it was supposed to happen. And then somehow she figured out that this had been a false alarm. One, one her thing I heard, she said, the Satans were just testing us. <laughs> and it was really in 2012 that this, this Planet X was going to come. So she just basically pushed reset like you do on a computer and reset it to 2012. And she's still out there uh, promoting this a lot. Zechariah Sitkin died a couple of years ago, but he published about 20 books. Uh, the best known is that one called The Twelfth Planet from back in the 70s, in which he claimed that he had traveled to Iraq, to the ancient Mesopotamian civilization of Sumer, and had found documents, that is, clay tablets that no one else had seen, and figured out how to translate them, even though scholars say he doesn't know the language at all. And so he started building these books up about it. Uh, it's, uh, it's too bad. I, I don't know whether, I like to call his book science fiction, but I'm sure he wouldn't have appreciated that. Uh, but they spin a fabulous story that Nibiru uh, was a god and a planet that the ancient Sumerians had far greater knowledge of science and even of astronomy than we do today. That they, for instance, knew about all the planets out through Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. They knew their sizes, their colors, their spins, you know, and, uh, and Nibiru was one of them. And how did they get this information? Well, they got this information from extraterrestrial aliens living on this planet Nibiru. And, and when it come about 7,000 years ago into the inner solar system, these guys had jumped off to Earth and, uh, and had taught the Sumerians all their science and technology. Maybe fathered some of them. I don't quite know about the details of that. Uh, and so these, these Anukai were the source of the information that this Nibiru planet was on a long-dated comet-like orbit with a period of 3,600 years. And it, uh, every 3,600 years, would come into the inner solar system. The planet, most I think he thought it was larger than Earth. And uh, in this particular case, it was due back uh, roughly 2012. He didn't have the date exact. And uh, it was uh, likely to produce terrible destruction on the Earth. Um, why don't we just point out one of many problems with this. You may know that the planets in the solar system have very regular orbits, especially the inner planets. The Earth has an almost circular orbit. Venus does. If there were something as massive or more massive as the Earth that every 3,600 years came through the inner solar system, it would screw up those orbits something awful. It would strip the moon off. Uh, it would leave a signature that would be unmistakable. And so whatever people did or didn't see, the fact that we have stable orbits and the moon going around the Earth says that some big, massive perturber cannot have repeatedly come through the inner solar system. In fact, there can't have been any such event any time in the last several million years. So all other things aside, just the fact of the solar system's existence, the moon, and the planets, says that this can't happen. Uh, but he sold a lot of books, and many people take him seriously. Then we come to John Major Jenkins. The man I told you is known as an independent researcher who has devoted himself to deciphering the Mayans. And you will have a speaker on the Mayan story, right? Yeah. So I guess I don't have to try to go into it. I'm certainly not an expert on it. But he also thinks that the Mayans <laughs> were smarter than we are. That is, they had better astronomy. And they, he also thinks they got it from aliens. So it's a little bit like the, the Sumerians and Nibiru. Um, and he then tries to interpret and says the Mayan calendar, more accurate than ours, they were able to predict the motions of planets, all these things that calendars do with extraordinary accuracy. And I still get 
question after question from people saying, the Mayans knew more than we do about astronomy, the Mayan calendar was better than ours, why do you doubt it? Well, because it isn't so. Mayan calendar is kind of interesting <clears throat> from many perspectives, but one is it's a day counting calendar. It doesn't have weeks and months and all those sort of things. It has cycles, which are tied to planetary motions, at least some of them are. And, uh, and so they're all things with a bunch of big wheels turning at different speeds, and occasionally they line up about once every 500 years. And that's the end of an era and the start of the next one. And that's going to happen sometime around 2012. Now, the nice thing about cycles is, of course, they keep going. They all line up for a day, and then they start their cycles again, and it goes on. There's no more reason to think that that will produce the end of the world <coughs> excuse me, than your own desk calendar. Now, I don't know about you, I, my calendar on my desk ends on December 31st. <laughs> it has never occurred to me that that meant the world will end then. And in fact, if I flip the page, up comes the January calendar. But he thinks it will, and he thinks that the date for which this will happen is December 21st, the winter solstice, in 2012. And that is the whole origin of the 2012 date. The previous people I talked about, Nancy Leader with her message from the Satans, and Zacharias Sitkin with his decipherment of Sumerian tablets, never had a date with any precision. But they all climbed onto the same thing, and that's how we have the story that December 21st, 2012, is doomsday. Now, <coughs> let me come back to a story I actually regret to have to tell you. Have you all seen Michio Kaku on TV? Yes. He's a very, you know, glib, articulate, uh, he's a string theorist, a cosmologist, most of us don't understand cosmology, so we don't know if he's right or not. He grew up in San Jose, he went to Berkeley, and he now has become, well, I think he probably thinks of himself as the new Carl Sagan, as someone who appears a lot of times. He has his own television show. And he started getting on this thing uh, a few years ago that all the, the solar scientists, he's not a solar scientist, he does this at best, fancy cosmology. The solar scientists and NASA were underestimating the danger of the next solar maximum. That the solar maximum would occur in December 2012. It would be 20 times greater than was predicted or was normal. Now when I say solar maximum, I'm talking about the sunspot cycle. 11 year period. And at the peak of that cycle, there are lots of sunspots, but more to the point, there are solar eruptions, there are flares, there are things called coronal mass ejections. That's when we see aurora. That's when we sometimes have disturbance with radio or communication. Um, and one has to take this seriously. Um, at least you have to take it seriously if you're involved with, with operating the satellites in orbit. Because being above the atmosphere, they're much more vulnerable to the streams of, of radiation and particles from the sun. And so we've had to build our, our satellites with fault protection. In fact, one of the ways many of them operate is if there's a prediction of one of these solar events, you simply turn it off for a few hours. Which doesn't help if that's the satellite your cell phone works through or something, but, but it protects it. And uh, he says things that just drive me crazy. There's a clip of him on Fox News in which he says that when this maximum occurs, the solar magnetic field suddenly flips and sends out a blast of radiation across the solar system that could destroy all our satellites, all our electronics, even our, our electrical distribution systems. That's just not so. Uh, and to add to that, he said this was going to happen in December 2012. Well, the sun has been acting very poorly. Very, it's very hard to predict. Uh, the solar cycle is there, but it isn't regular, and you never know how high it's going to be. In fact, the solar cycle is very late and very low. 
we had almost unprecedented span of three years without any sunspots. So it's not going to reach its peak in 2012, probably in 2013, and it's going to be a weaker peak than usual, not a bigger one. So this to me is just fear monitoring. I don't know why he does it, but he does. Um, and NASA contributed in an interesting way. One of the things you see when you analyze these is that people end up losing any sense of the time, the chronology. This was back in 2006, before we knew there was going to be a long solar night, before we knew that, that, that this was going to be a weak maximum, and NASA put out a story. We were at the minimum, and they pointed out to people that the maximum would be coming along, which is fine, except for the title, Solar Storm Morning. I have been fascinated by how many people interpret a solar storm as like a hurricane. They think that, I mean, people say, when the solar storm comes, there are going to be intense waves and tsunamis, etc. Uh, so NASA didn't help with that one at all. But it's obsolete in any case. This is a 2006 prediction. Um, most of the rest of what I'm going to talk to you about are the Q&A that I have with people. And I hope I can explain what the real science is with science behind some of these. If I don't, if I'm unclear, please just interrupt me and ask. Because I can get carried away with these strange questions and, uh, and sometimes forget to actually explain what's going on. Well, NASA comes into this field because in 1983, we built a satellite called the Infrared Astronomy Satellite, or IRS, which was the very first infrared survey system that could get above the atmosphere. The atmosphere blocks out most of the infrared, so this was a actually fairly small satellite, aperture body. But it was cooled and it was taken above the atmosphere and for about 10 months it did an all-sky survey. And of course it discovered many new things. That was the whole point of the survey. And many of them initially were not identified. One NASA story that came out fairly early in the mission was just somebody went through and found, I think it was eight strong sources that were unidentified. And they said, here we've just discovered eight strong infrared sources. They're not identified. And uh, they could be distant galaxies or they could even be a, a, a planet in the outer part of our solar system that we haven't seen. A few months later, they did find out what they all were and they were all distant extragalactic sources. But because that appeared in the newspaper, these questions come back to me over and over and over. And they use the same phrasing. They say, it appeared in seven major national newspapers in 1983 that NASA had discovered this unknown planet in the outer solar system. Um, the fact is, of course, that survey has been superseded by at least three much more powerful satellites one from Europe and two from NASA, the much deeper uh, surveys, and none of them has ever found a mysterious planet in the outer solar system. Then there's Planet X itself. People say NASA discovered Planet X. What would you think when you saw the name Planet X? X is unknown, right? Planet X is the name astronomers have used for more than a century for a planet that doesn't exist, that is, that might exist or is suspected uh, for 25 years before Pluto was discovered, it was called Planet X. In other words, they, we were searching for Planet X and then they found it. Other things have been called Planet X, but as soon as they are discovered, they stop being Planet X and become a real name like Pluto or Eris. So, I, th that's a troublesome terminology anyway. When they say NASA discovered Planet X, Planet X is going to threaten us. Um, I don't know, what do you say? Uh, if, if it's called Planet X, that means it isn't real. Um, have you ever heard of HARP? H-A-A-R-P? Good. This is a big ionospheric experiment. It's been going for several years, operated at the University of Alaska with support from the U.S. Navy that sends radio waves 
microwaves into the atmosphere, which changes the ionosphere, and then they measure what comes back. It's a, it's a probe, basically, of the levels of the ionosphere going up and down. And they do it in the polar regions because that's where the aurora are. And it's more interesting to see. That's where the ionosphere is more dynamic. There is a set of beliefs that this is not only a secret government device, but its purpose, get this, is to cause earthquakes. And every time there's an earthquake, it's said that harp caused them. And people try to keep track when harp is turned on and when it's turned off, because this is part of a government plot to produce earthquakes. They don't quite understand why. Um, in 2005, a new planet was discovered in the outer solar system called Eris. Slightly larger than Pluto. Now, you all know that we have a little bit of a dispute over how to define planet, and it's now called the dwarf planet, as is Pluto. But I kept, here again, I got the like, NASA in 2005 discovered planet X, which they, I, they identified with meteor. For three years, I've been getting questions saying, why don't you tell us about the pictures of meteor being taken by the South Pole Telescope? which is another research instrument. It doesn't take pictures. It's a microwave research <laughs> instrument. It isn't run by NASA. It's run by the National Science Foundation. It has a website. You can find out what it's doing. It is not there to take pictures of Nibiru, but that's what they claim. And since these pictures aren't being released, because there aren't any, that's a big cover-up. I love this one because I don't think I have it all there. People said the South Pole Telescope has to have been built in order to track Nibiru. <clears throat> Otherwise, you could have built it just as easily at the North Pole. <laughs> How's your geography, guys? What's at the North Pole? Arctic. The Arctic Ocean, right. Um, and so, you know, every little thing that can be misinterpreted is. Pardon? That's right, and maybe, let's see, how can we play that in? Is that because I wouldn't want to tell us something? Um, because of this fascination, people made all sorts of statements about what Nibiru was. You know, I'm trying to get pictures. I've got a couple to show you. Here is an object in May 2002, September. It's clearly expanded, and so they interpreted that was the planet Nibiru getting closer to us. Um, and I didn't know what it was, but I could tell it wasn't moving. If you look at the star pattern, it's exactly the same in both of them. The object's bigger. It's not, not moving sideways like any planetary object would. And this was fun because I put it on my website. And just a few days later, I got this nice note from a 15-year-old teenager saying, I can help. I can help. I know what that is. That's B838 Mon, a, 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 plant, a nebula. And I looked it up, and it's exactly what it was. And here, this happens to be a Hubble picture of it. So, you know, that made me feel good. That was a bright kid who recognized this particular object. Here's another picture of it. Um, by the way, whenever these pictures are put on the internet, they have no dates. They don't tell you the, uh, they're nothing for scale. They don't tell you what the instrument was. You have to be clever to think what it was. That was taken in Australia, and it didn't take long to figure out that was the sun seen during those terrible smoke that they had in Sydney about a year and a half ago from the forest fires. Here's another one. Um, pretty hard to tell what that is. You can see it's pixelated. And, uh, I wondered, I mean, I figured it was, it was obviously fake. You could make that in your computer, but I wondered how. And again, that was a high school kid that came through. It was wonderful. He wrote to me and said, at first he didn't believe when I said that this wasn't real. But he was taking a Photoshop class in high school. I don't know how many high schools saw Photoshop classes. And so he said one day he just started with, with a, a, some red color and in an hour recreated that picture exactly which I thought was pretty clever.
All right, let's, let's talk about comma element because it has become the dominant source of questions to me on Ask an Astrobiologist. It was discovered in December, last December, by a Russian amateur astronomer. Comets are named after the discoverer, so it's named Elliman. He actually was using a robotic telescope in New Mexico. It's interesting how international astronomy is. And it was quite faint. It was determined to be a long period comet, with a period of more than 10,000 years. In fact, it might be its first pass through the inner solar system. It's been out in the deep freeze of space for four billion years, and something perturbed its orbit, so it's coming in. And so there was a lot of interest in the fact of how bright would it get. If it's never been in the inner solar system before, of course, you don't know. And so they thought it might be a naked eye object by now. You know, a nice comet you can see with a tail. Well, it didn't live up to this. That's a picture that's about as good as any of them. And you can see it's not exactly a splendid object. Uh, in fact, it was even too faint to be seen with binoculars. And then, two weeks ago, it suddenly faded. Dropped by a factor of two, then another factor of two in brightness. Its center part started changing shape. And it's pretty clear now, just in the last few days, that it broke apart. And comets do that sometimes. Comets are made of friable stuff. They have water ice. When they get close to the sun and get hot, sometimes they just melt and fall apart. So I am waiting to see what the people who are afraid of comet element think now. Probably that NASA went down and destroyed it. <laughs> or maybe we found out a way to make it dark so that people couldn't see it anymore. It'll be interesting because it was such a big deal until a week ago. So here are the claims that I see often on the internet. First is that Leonid Elenin is not a real person. Now these pictures are out there, he has a website, but no, he's not a real person. And the name is a code because ELE, if you remember from the movie Deep Impact, stands for Extinction Level Event. Now, I don't understand the psychology of people that think they would keep this secret but code it so that everyone can tell. Um, over and over, people said NASA is imposing a news blackout because there aren't pictures of it. Uh, you know, it is not in the newspapers. Now, my explanation is there aren't pictures and it's not in the newspapers because it's not very interesting. It's a very faint comment, hard to see. Their explanation was there aren't pictures and there aren't stories in the newspaper because NASA is suppressing it. The most disturbing are the claims that this comet caused the Chile earthquake in 2010 and the Big Japan earthquake in 2011. It boggles my mind how a little comet, which is not as big as this town, I mean, it's like two or three kilometers across, millions and millions of miles away, was supposed to cause an earthquake. There is no conceivable explanation. But they say, well, of course it does. Uh, earthquakes are caused by the moon. Earthquakes are caused by planets. Uh, no, they aren't. But uh, I don't know what you can say, except I pointed out repeatedly that it was small. It was a little dinky comment. In fact, my Don Yeomans, my colleague at JPL, JPL calls it a wimpy comet, which is a good name. So then the answer came back, of course, what's well, not a comet? It's a massive black dwarf. It's a brown dwarf. Brown dwarf. It's something uh, 10, 20, 50 times more massive than Jupiter. And that's what's happening. And you say, well, gee, wouldn't you think if it were a brown dwarf that massive it would be affecting the orbits of Jupiter and Mars and Earth as it came past? which it has not at all. Um, it gets more fun. There, is, there are pictures that show it's accompanied by several UFOs. And some say the, the aliens and the UFOs are controlling the comet and steering it so it will hit Earth. Now, its orbit doesn't come any closer than 34 million kilometers, about 22 million miles. But they say, oh, it's going to change its orbit and hit us. Um, and by the way, uh, 
In the next week, it's going to come between the sun and the earth and block out the sun for three days. So it'll be three days of total darkness next week when this comet blocks out the sun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, then uh, it's interesting because these two things come together. There are actually many people who say that, well, Ellen is really meager in disguise coming a year early. Um, the orbit thing is interesting. They're, like all these objects, the NASA JPL uh, calculates orbits and tabulates where they are and what they're doing. And you can go on the website and see, updated I think every hour, the position of the comet it will give us distance from Earth, its distance from the Sun, and so on. And people wrote to me in shock. They said, its orbit is changing. When I looked on the, the JPL website today, it had a different distance from the Earth and from the Sun than it did the previous day. Yes, it's on an orbit. You know, an orbit moves. It's going toward and around the Sun. They, I guess, hadn't thought of that. They thought it was somehow stationary in space. And if, if it were moving, if its distance from Earth was changing, that meant it was under this alien control, steering it in some way that was mysterious. Now, Ellen probably is no more. We probably won't know that for sure until it reemerges from the sun in October. But I bet there's not going to be anything left. And I'm just waiting to hear what the explanations are that are on the internet, because I know there will be many. There are many people that will not accept the scientific explanation. <clears throat> so here are just a few questions, I'm going to go through them quickly, that I've received. I told you this, President said, how can you call Niebuhr a hoax when IRS detected it, and it was in the newspapers? Um, there are people who quote the Bible. Now, Niebuhr, of course, is not named in the Bible, but some of the early Bible stories do go back almost to the days of Sumer. Um, there are people who were saying even two years ago that it was visible from the southern hemisphere in the daytime, but invisible here. That, that, I'm sorry, that doesn't, doesn't work out either. Um, the South Pole Telescope I mentioned. And then there are people who say that there are beings on the Earth and that these guys are coming back and goodness knows what they'll do to us when they get here in December 2012. One of the common questions or claims is that Nibiru or Elenin or any of these celestial things could cause a pole shift, by which people mean that the rotation axis of the Earth will suddenly flip or change. And that will produce earthquakes and disasters and all sorts of things. And it can't happen. Uh, you know, you've got a gyroscopic effect. Here's the Earth with all this momentum going around. Nothing can exert a force to tilt it over. And uh, I guess that's hard to explain. I'm not sure. You know, it's very hard to say something's impossible. It's very hard to explain why it's impossible. But it is. And uh, you know, what can I say? Um, there is an alignment story that I haven't even talked about that the real cause of this disaster is not Nibiru at all, but the fact that on December 21st, 2012, the Sun, the Earth, and the center of our galaxy line up in alignment. And that will somehow produce terrible things. That the, this alignment will focus the, I don't know what, gravity wave from the center of the galaxy on us or something. Um, and that one's true. The sun and the earth and the center of the galaxy do line up in late December of 2012. And they'll line up at the same time this year and last year and 10 years from now and 10 years ago. It's just what happens when the, the uh, earth in its orbit gets so that the sun is approximately between us and the center of the galaxy. 2012 is no different from any other time. Um, uh, this stuff about the Earth standing still, flipping its pole and all that, it, I wouldn't even mention it except that this is what people say, according to NASA scientists, this is true. So I jumped into the morass and started looking at YouTube videos, saying you'd be surprised, perhaps, how many of those videos are by NASA scientists. They will tell you so. 
It may be some strange looking guy standing in his kitchen, you know, with the webcam, but he says, I am a NASA scientist and I'm telling you so and so. Or I know a NASA scientist who leaked this information to me. And it's just part of the fact that, that you know, people can say anything on the internet. And as, as this fear has risen, a lot of people have written me and say, can't you stop it? Can't, can't you get President Obama to give a speech to tell people there's no danger in 2012? Can't you force these people to take their things off the, the internet? And of course you can't. Uh, there's no law against lying, except under oath in a court of law. People lie all the time. And my guess is the majority of the things on the internet and YouTube are not true. Of course, I am suspect because I work for the government, and the government is evil. Um, this is the sort of statement you get. I know the government is corrupt, and NASA is part of the government. <coughs> well, I guess I wonder if they really believe that, why they would write to a NASA website <laughs> to get the information. I don't know how to respond to that, if people truly believe that the government is their enemy. Uh, there's not much you can say. Uh, but it bothers me. I mean, this is the sort of thing I get frequently. Not that you're really going to tell me the truth, but I know you took an oath uh, that wouldn't allow you to tell the truth. What amazes me is that this same argument is applied to the whole scientific community. There are people who believe that all of this thing about Nibiru and, and coming destruction is just being kept secret. That, uh, that the reason they don't read about in the newspapers is because of a government clampdown. And uh, there's an interesting thing that, that I guess people don't generally realize. And that is that almost all the science that NASA does, for instance, actually comes from academic astronomers. People like, like you. I mean, you know, the, the folks that, that go out and observe the big telescopes, like the Keck telescope in Hawaii is privately owned. Even the Hubble Space Telescope is operated by a consortium of universities. Um, the truth of it is that it's the, the academic scientists who provide the information to NASA, not the other way around. NASA doesn't control the information. And in the case of Nibiru, or Planet X, or whatever you want to call it, if it were some planet that was going to come near us 15 months from now, it would be a naked eye object. It would have been visible easily in telescopes for three or four years. And there are at least 100,000 astronomers in the world, amateur and professional, with telescopes who could show it. So they apparently, these people on the internet, believe that all 100,000 astronomers in 150 countries were ordered by all their governments to not tell the truth about this. And they obeyed those orders. Well, I know astronomers. <laughs> you couldn't tell six astronomers to be quiet and hide something. <laughs> uh, I mean, things just get out amazingly quickly. I'll tell you a story that illustrates that. It's not about this, but it's about SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, where they haven't found any signals yet, but you know, it's a serious enterprise. And about two years ago, um, three years ago, they were observing and actually found a signal that initially bore all the, the it passed all the tests. It was, you know, a modulated signal. It was coming from an area where there were no stars. It was observed on two different telescopes. <coughs> and so for about eight hours, they sat there. You know, talking to other astronomers a little bit, trying to get verification, wondering, could this possibly be the real thing? Halfway through that eight hours, the phone rang at the control console at this telescope. And the guy said, this is his name from the New York Times. I hear you have a signal. <laughs> no one knows how he found it. But that's the kind of time scale. About four hours before someone uh, learns about it. So none of these secrecy things make any sense to me. Um, and I just want to conclude by saying that, that it's more than, than just a, uh, a funniness, a funny story, crazy story, crazy people. Because uh, I have received questions like this over and over. I would say at least once a month I get a 
question from a teenager, or even as young as 11, saying they're planning to commit suicide uh, before December 2012, end of the world. I've had five or six women who have written saying that they were going to kill themselves and their children before then. Um, you can read these kind of things. I'm in the eighth grade. I don't want to go to school anymore. I don't want to spend time with my family. I don't want to live. I believe I deserve an explanation. A man on TV said that if government officials spoke up, they would be killed. And then this one actually got through to me. I think it's probably an older person who said, I'm so scared. My only friend is my little dog. When should I put her to sleep so she won't suffer when the earth is destroyed? So, you know, I think, I think this sort of strange hysteria has consequences. Um, so I'm not going to try to say more about it. Uh, if you really went on to all these YouTube videos and all these websites, you'd just find one variant after another spinning these stories. They're almost always the cause of a conspiracy. It's almost always the government or somebody who's trying to keep it a secret. And, and they are frightening people, and they're frightening children. The group that has, until you, has been most raised their hands saying that they knew about this are teachers, because they get it from their kids. And the kids tell each other. And it, and it becomes, it spreads so that I expect the great majority of people who are afraid of 2012 are under 15. And I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong to frighten children. I think that most adults can laugh this off as just kind of silliness. But we should be worried about the effect it has. And one effect it has, which I have seen over and over, is people are not just afraid of this stuff. They are afraid of almost anything in astronomy. I call this cosmophobia. And here is a list of all the things I have had in questions. There are people afraid of the Earth's magnetic field changing. They're changing in the Earth's rotation axis. They're afraid of an alignment of Jupiter and Saturn. They're afraid of heating the Earth's core. They're afraid the Earth will cross the galactic equator. Uh, they're afraid of black holes. They're afraid of dust clouds. They're afraid of the dark rift of the Milky Way. They're afraid of collision with the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. They're collision with the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, impacts on Earth by various aspects. These are all real things. They have read them in astronomy. Uh, and lots of questions, things about black holes. It's true that, the, uh, that we're moving toward the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy and that the Andromeda Galaxy is moving toward us. It'll, it'll get here in, in less than a billion years. Um, but it's just become routine that if there was any story about an astronomy discovery, I will get several questions saying, will it hurt me? Will it kill me? Will it destroy the Earth? Even if it's been a distant galaxy. When I grew up in astronomy, I loved it. I loved to look through my telescope. I loved the sky. I loved reading about astronomy discoveries. And it really saddens me that there's, there's at least part of a generation who, whenever they hear about a new discovery, think of it as a danger. And I find that very sad. So thank you for your attention. Somebody has a question. Oh, what did you say your website was again? Ask an astrobiologist. <clears throat> and you could also do David Morris and NASA. And you know that will lead you to all these things. I have two videos on YouTube that I made to try to appeal to the people who, and I know there are lots of them who get their information from YouTube, not even from websites. And, and try to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, I thought that I had read when um, tsunami hit Japan, Japan that that had shifted the access. Is that? Can you speak right to that? Right, you are exactly. I think uh, I don't know how much. I know how much <clears throat> in the case of the Chile earthquake, it shifted the access by three inches. Mm -hmm. Oh, three inches. Three inches. <laughs> I thought it was. And and of course that is almost immeasurably small. They didn't actually measure that the axis had changed by three inches. They calculated how much it would change just by the fact that during a big, big Earth movement, 
some things move in and out a little bit, and the Earth, just by conservation of angular momentum, adjusts its, its rotation axis and speed. Um, you know, the, you could, and so you can tell this will happen. If you're talking about changing the Earth's axis by a few inches, it happens all the time. It happens when glaciers move, all sorts of things. What they are talking about is some sudden rapid shift. Particularly, they predicted in the case of Common Element, on one of these websites, that the comet would cause the Earth to suddenly shift its axis by 10 degrees. And that would then produce all these consequences. Instead of the other way around, the earthquake very slightly changes the axis. There are a lot of things that you have to worry about being categorical statements. Uh, you know, I can't say the Earth's axis never changes. I can say it never changes by a measurably large amount. If it did, by the way, the first people would know is the astronomers. Because they go the next night to their telescope and they wouldn't point right. <laughs> yeah? I just wondered if you or any of your colleagues are producing any materials that teachers could use to counteract some of these here? Well, yes and no. Uh, on my Ask an Astrobiologist website, I have, in addition to answering hundreds of questions, I have written a summary, you know, sort of 20 questions, the 20 main things they're asked and the answers. I've done these two YouTube videos. Those are not in the format, you know, of a, of a lesson plan or something for teachers, but the information is there. And I hope they use it. And I don't want to be entirely pessimistic. Every week I get heartwarming letters from people thanking me for doing this. And in particular from parents who say things like, you know, my little boy was unable to sleep, was crying all the time. We took him to a psychologist, he didn't know what was wrong, he was afraid of the end of the earth. I sat him down and, let, and talked him into watching your video for four minutes, and that did it. He got over it. Yeah? Do you know about some of this tied in with the idea of the rapture? <laughs> well, it's, this has been a good year, hasn't it? <laughs> uh, you don't have to wait till 2012. Uh, on, uh, on May 20th, all the, the good people were supposed to go straight to heaven. And since I didn't notice anybody missing, I guess maybe there aren't many good people. <laughs> but now, Camping has another prediction for October, is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't think anyone can easily keep track of all the the predicted catastrophes, maybe that's not a catastrophe, maybe that's good if you're transported to heaven. But, you know, it, they just come up, and one question that always comes to mind is, well, now Comet Ellen is, is gone, what will happen to all those people? Well, will they pick another comet? It's actually an asteroid that comes so very close to the Earth in November, maybe that will be the next one. When December 12th comes and nothing happens to it. Well, we already had the example of Nancy Leader pushing reset and, and making it, having it a few years later. You, you would think that this would be a learning opportunity, that people, having been afraid of something like this when it doesn't happen, would say, gee, I must have been built by these fear mongers. I don't know. Yeah? Am I aging myself by asking, how does Nostradamus predictions come into this? How does Nostradamus? Oh, Nostradamus. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the fact that when you once get a, a theme, an idea, Doomsday 2012, all this stuff accretes to it. And one of it's Nostradamus. Now, Nostradamus, as far as I can tell, uh, wrote such enigmatic quatrains that people can, pre can say it means almost anything. And, and if you come up with anything, like you know, the Twin Towers, read, Attacked. You can find a Nostradamus quatrain that, with appropriate spin, means something in the same way here. So there, I, I'm really unhappy with the fact that this has moved into the cable television, where the Discovery Channel and the History Channel and the Science Channel, thoroughly misnamed, have shows every week on some aspect of this disaster. And some of them are about Nostradamus. And, uh, there are some about the E-Chain. Did you know the E-Chain predicts the end of the world in 2012? Oh. Did you know the, the Old Testament predicts it in 2012? Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, they, once you get the idea, you can layer all kinds of stuff on it. 
what, that thing in the north called the harp, H-A-R-P? Uh -huh, in Alaska. Well, what is, in Alaska. What is that thing exactly? Well, I know you'd like me to say, what does it stand for? Yeah, or, or, you, <sighs> or what is it there for? It's a low-frequency radio transmitter that transmits straight up, and then a receiver that receives the signals that bounce from different levels in the ionosphere. And it's powerful enough that it can actually heat the ionosphere in a small area. And so people can do, in effect, experiments. You put an experimental heat pulse into the ionosphere, and you look at how fast <coughs> the, uh, the electrons and atoms recombine, and this sort of thing. So it's, it's a basic research instrument. Uh, there's another one at Arecibo in Puerto Rico. There are actually several. It was interesting because it's built in the auroral region, in the north, where there's much more <laughs> electrical activity in the upper atmosphere than elsewhere. It doesn't cause earthquakes. Yeah. <laughs> um, when, like, you know, the dinosaurs were wiped out by a giant comet or asteroid, um, uh, what did that do to our access and, and different things? Like, what do we know about that? Well, know you can't measure anything. Obviously, I may seem old to you with my white hair, but I don't remember what that is. But you can calculate on impact, just like you can on earthquake, how much difference it would make. Uh, and it's very, very small. Again, you're talking about moving the pole by inches or changing the length of the day by a millionth of a second or something like that. Are, are we scared of something that size or are we scared we? of something like way bigger? I mean, <laughs> are you scared of something that size? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> well, you I should be, you well, should well, definitely. What NASA looks at, I guess? Do they look at, at yeah. things about that size? Or? Well, when we started, and I'm getting off into this other thing now, 20 years ago, promoting optical surveys to find what asteroids were up there that could hit us. That was our first concern, an extinction level impact. Mm -hmm. And a uh, 10 or 15 kilometer diameter asteroid, uh, you know, something not much bigger than, than the uh, San Francisco Peninsula could do that. We quickly found that there were none up there on any sort of possible collision course. And we worked it down now to the level of the one mile ones that we think there are none. You know, we're sort of 90, 98% sure. Uh, so yes, we would worry about it a whole lot if, we, if there was something there. But I'm happy to tell you that the astronomers have stepped in on a white bars and figured out that you're not going to be killed by a worldwide asteroid impact catastrophe. Send money to the astronomers. <laughs> uh, using pure logic, the only way I can think, of course, <clears throat> H-A-R-P must mean help aliens reach planet. <laughs> <laughs> I really should know what it means. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, this is an aside, but, but uh, everybody uses acronyms. And... Uh, at least within NASA, we make a real effort to pick acronyms that are pronounceable and sort of mean something. And I don't know, I'm sure they realized when they put this name together that it would come out as heart, you know, something you'd block. Uh, I'm not sure why, but, but you will find some very strange acronyms precisely because people want them to be memorable and pronounceable as opposed to logic. <laughs> The, um, on NOVA, a couple of years ago, I saw a show called Magnetic Storm, and it was talking about how the polar caps, they, can, they change over time. They have, like, on the sun or earth? Oh, on the earth. Yeah. On the earth, yeah, north and south mm -hmm. pole in the magnetic. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it, they showed that there's proof, you know, you know in, the, in the rock that is done. Right. And they, there was one scientist that said it, it could happen in, in a week's time, and then he had to improve it. But they didn't uh, make any, um, you know, predictions of right. what would happen. But if there was such a thing, what would that uh, do to our... Um well, the last magnetic pole reversal took place about 650,000 years ago. So there was no one around to record it. And, you know, it's really hard. We, we don't see any effect. There have been these reversals every few hundred thousand years. And they're, they're actually very useful to geologists. Um, but there's never been any correlation of one of those reversals with an extinction 
or any indication that anything bad happened. Now we live in a very highly tuned civiliz technical civilization and I can't say for sure nothing would happen. Uh, there are animals that use the magnetic field to sense direction, like birds who use it for migration north to south. If the pole suddenly changed, they would get very confused. Um, and we don't know how suddenly it takes place. Uh, I, it perhaps could happen quickly, but most of the people I've talked to think that changing the Earth's magnetic field is a big enough deal, it would probably take a thousand years or more. It would go down, it would, some places would pop up with the new orientation, some with the old, but nobody knows. I just wanted to follow up on that because uh, you know, it's like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, but but when you think when we, we've been talking about poles flipping and how that can't that can't happen or it moves of three inches, when you're talking about the magnetic pole moving, we're talking about not that there can't be some issues, but we're talking about that the the needle on your compass would flip from one direction to the other direction, and nothing about the Earth turning over or spin yeah. changing. Absolutely, and, and that is a point of confusion that I think has been intentionally exploited. I call it a bait and switch. They talk to people, these people who are promoting disasters, that, about the fact that the Earth's magnetic field can reverse and you know get you in with that. And then suddenly, without you noticing it, they're talking about the rotation <coughs> pole reversing, which is completely different. And you all know, I'm sure, that the North Magnetic Pole is not the same location as the North rotation pole. They're, they're really very different things. Yeah. Hot means high frequency active oral research program. Thank you. Uh, isn't Google wonderful? Uh, yeah, but what, what you told me is, see there really should be an F, the high frequency. And they've left the F off so it'll be pronounceable. That's the kind of thing I mean about people uh, trying to get acronyms that look nice. If it had the HFA, you couldn't pronounce it. Are you coming up here for a reason? Yeah, I'm coming here to thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs>